Okay, uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the, uh, I was just, oh, just I was very impressed with that. I, we haven't met before, but it was uh, resonated very strongly with, uh, I'm sure, with many of us in the room. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, so the, the title of the abstract that I've, is in the booklet is uh, What is Needed for the UN Development Goals to be Achieved? Um, now, I've got an answer for that, um, and it's a one-word answer. Uh, so it, what I prefer to do is talk about that one word rather than the UN and the UN Development Goals. Not that these are important uh, and significant, um, but let's talk about the things that are most important. So that the, the answer proposed, what is needed for the UN Development Goals to be achieved, in a word, is this wisdom. So what I'd, if you're happy, I prefer to spend this time talking about wisdom rather than UN development goals. Uh, and one of the reasons is that um, what I, I, I don't think I'm going to add anything to what's been said so far, but more make explicit what I've been hearing has been implicit in almost everything I've been hearing in the conference so far. Um, there are a few who claim wisdom, but the sense is if you listen, what is behind, say, the whole conference and the presentations, I suggest, is this really key thing of, of wisdom. Uh, for us in the School of Economic Science, this is really very fundamental. Uh, as Ian mentioned last night, al although our essential purpose is single, uh, we have developed two strands. One is philosophy and the other economics. What is philosophy essentially? The love of wisdom. And I suppose us as economists are, are tasked really to imbue economics with wisdom. Um, so what is wisdom and, and where do we find it? Uh, I think essentially, uh, and it's the sense of what I've learned this morning, is that we find it ultimately within ourselves. Uh, but there is help, uh, there is guidance in this, and I see the essence of the philosophical and spiritual traditions is to give us guidance and help into what the nature of, of wisdom is. Um, in this part of the world, the essential philosophical tradition takes us back to the, the ancient Greeks, and particularly people uh, Socrates and Plato. And Ian last night uh, pointed out that, uh, in a way, this, this uh, culture was revitalized in the Renaissance, and we feel particularly through this uh, philosopher Marsilio Ficino, who, who played a big part in re reinvigorating an interest in, uh, in Plato. And uh, Ian mentioned that uh, one of the tasks the school has taken on is to translate the various letters that... Uh, Massilio Ficino wrote to various people. I just thought it'd be appropriate to read the very first letter. It's not, in fact, from Marsilio Ficino, it's to Massilio Ficino from Cosimo de Medici, who was his patron and very famous banker. And so he says, Cosimo to Marsilio, greetings. Yesterday I went to my villa at Carigi, but for the sake of cultivating cultivating my mind and not the estate. So I think this is quite close, close to home. Come to us, Marsilio, as soon as possible. Bring with you Plato's book on the highest good, which I suppose you have translated from Greek into Latin as you promised. I want nothing more wholeheartedly than to know which way leads most surely to happiness. Farewell. Come and bring your Orphic liar with you. So Marsilio, in, in obedience, um, responds to the, uh, both the, re the request and, and the letter and writes back in reply. And his reply is, is a suggestion to, Mar Mar um, to Cosimo 
as how he would find his happiness. And essentially what he's doing is um, passing on something that he's recently discovered in the works of Plato. Um, and this is what he says, that, uh, to put it very briefly, that all men want to live well, which is to act well, and that happiness consists of the achievement of the desired goal. So how is that desired goal achieved? And Plato, through Marcelo, says, well, the first thing is it's helpful is to be endowed with good things. And these are things like health, riches, beauty, strength, and power. But he says, it's not enough just to have those good things. You have to use them. And then he says, it's not just enough to use them. You have to use them rightly. And then he says, it's wisdom that ensues the right use of these gifts. And therefore, it enables us to achieve the desired goal. And that could be the UN Development Goal. So that gives us an indication of the, the place of wisdom. It's that thing which enables us to, to realise the, these basic desires. Does that help us as economists? Um, there are not many economists I've found who have taken a big interest in wisdom. Uh, one of the few is Fritz Schumacher. And this is one of the things he said in, in Small is Beautiful. Today, man is far too clever to be able to survive without wisdom. The exclusion of wisdom from economics, science and technology was something which we could perhaps get away with as long as we were relatively unsuccessful. I think that's an unsuccessful in uh, inverted commas. But now we have become very successful and the spiritual and moral, the spiritual and moral truth moves into a central position. I think, say, the successful may be an in inverted commons, but the sense is such is the power that we have and the, the power to have an effect on each other and the world that we can't, can no longer do without it. So what was wisdom to, to Schumacher? Uh, as, as an economist, he had a very active life, but at the same time pursued a, an inner quest, uh, which took him various places. It took him to, uh, to Buddhism, uh, to the esoteric tradition, uh, but finally to the, the Roman Catholic tradition. And there he found the same virtues uh, that came out of the Platonic tradition, uh, temperance, courage, justice, and wisdom, were still there. Um, they, they, names had changed slightly through the, um, through the Latin. Uh, temperance was still there. Courage had become fortitude. Justice was still there. Wisdom had come into the Latin prudentia. And that came in, comes into English as prudence, which where the meetings, meaning's really lost. But pr prudentia in this tradition had the sense of, of practical wisdom. And the description right at the end of Small is Beautiful uh, of, of this practical wisdom. And it's, it's described as, as follows. So if you hear the word prudence, don't think about the sort of prude, think about practical wisdom. The preeminent, I'm going to say, that's what I'm going to say actually, the preeminence of practical wisdom means that realization of the good presupposes knowledge of reality. Realisation of the good presupposes that our actions are appropriate to the real situation. That is, to the concrete realities which form the environment of a concrete human action, and that we therefore take this concrete reality seriously and with clear-eyed objectivity. Now, if that sounds a bit technical, I, 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 if I may, I'll take the example that Nina and Doman gave this morning, because I thought that was a really good example of this practical wisdom. So there you have the, the situation in front of you, the concrete reality of Auschwitz. And he says, you've got to face up to that, that's how it is. 
But you also, what's required is a, is a knowledge of reality. And I would take that to include a knowledge of what it is to be a human being. It may not be a perfect knowledge, but it, it has that vision. And then, then he says, um, you have to act in accord with that. And I got the, the, the sense is that means no egoism, no ambition. You've got to recognize the situation that's right in front of you. And for them, it seemed all the nuances of the various powers that be there, the... Uh, and the influences, and that's what you have to work with and move forward, and I think that's what he calls about clear-eyed objectivity. And he adds that this, this prudentia or practical wisdom implies a transformation of the knowledge of truth into decisions corresponding to reality. And I would say, I, if you agree, that that, I would say, is, is a description, of, as I thought that was a, a, a clear example. And um, so the question is, does this have uh, application for, for economics? And it seems to be a very different view of what economics is about to developing theories, uh, models, and, and so on. Now, the sense is that, that our current uh, situation and the current um, way the economy working generally is getting a bad press and no doubt that there are um, we're getting into a bit of a mess and, it, and it's getting worse and conventional economics does not seem to be uh, having the answer however I, I don't feel that's the full story and for a while now I've been taking an interest of finding examples which move in the other direction and I think that's in, important for this theme of, of hope um, and in the paper there are Three examples, which I take to be of people who have worked in this way, that rather than working through theories and ideas, they have actually faced the situation head on. They've been informed by a sort of vision of what it is to be human, what humanity is about, and then acted in a way, and in all cases, that have actually lifted the lives of literally millions of people because what they found is a situation which doesn't, did not correspond to their vision of what it is to be human so essentially it was subhuman that was ineffective and so what is needed is a change to, to bring that uh, that vision I into reality there's not time to speak on all of these the first one in the paper is about about Fritz Schumacher and the work he did, particularly inspired by his visits to India on uh, what was originally called uh, alternative technologies, now appropriate technology, find out what people do and let them do it better. Work from the bottom, go to the villages um, and, and help them improve their lives. Uh, the, the second example is that of uh, Muhammad Yunus and the work that he did on, on microcredit, which again was an exploration uh, motivated by, sense by, a, a, by a sense of humanity, uh, but then looking out, seeing the situation, seeing what was practically needed, and moving in that direction. And I think in, in both cases, really moving in the exact opposite direction to what the conventional wisdom, and the, if I can use the word in that context, the conventional way of operating was. Um, so development was actually, conventionally, is all about industrialization, large scale, and banking similarly. So that if I've got time, the third example I'd like to speak about, which is perhaps less known, but I think is very relevant, is that of uh, Wolf Ladijinsky. Is this someone who's familiar to you? How can that be? This is the man who has done more to transform the lives of millions of people. Um, and yet we, we seem not to know of him um, and the context is particularly important because what Ladajinsky instigated was a fundamental transformation in the relationship between a group of people and the land on which they lived and the fact that this has happened once it indicates it could happen again, although the context now is slightly different. Um, so the, the setting for this story is 
from Japan in 1945. So the war is over, the atomic bombs have been dropped, the Japanese economy has been destroyed, and there is MacArthur, and he's got the job of sorting it out. And he's got uh, three things to face. Firstly, is that this country isn't really, it's so badly off, it's not capable of supporting, of feeding itself. Secondly, he's got to restore the economy. And thirdly, if he's not, this is not done quickly, efficiently, and in a way that makes everybody happy, he's going to have a communist uprising. So who was Wolf Ladojinsky? Uh, well, he was of the Jewish faith. He was born in Russia. He escaped at the time of the Russian Revolution to the United States. Uh, he wasn't, a, in, wasn't particularly interested in the land directly uh, because Jews weren't allowed to own the land. Uh, but he did notice what was going on in Russia in 1917 and noticed particularly that one of the um, main reasons that uh, Lenin was supported was his promise that he would give the peasants their land that they were working on. Um, and then he noticed that when the um, Russian government under Kerensky, um, and that's what, what Lenin did, fought back, um, they were nearly victorious, but what they did when they regained territory was they gave the land back to the previous owners. And the effect of that was to just lose the confidence of the Russian people and the Dijinsky felt effectively the, the revolution. So that Dijinsky escaped to the United States and was in Columbia University, studied economics, got very interested in agriculture, particularly rural agriculture in Asia, uh, and got a reputation for expertise. And the key to the way he operated was that he used to go in there and actually find out what was going on the, on the ground. It's quote said that what imprints on Ladojinsky's writing, their unmistakable stamp of reality and authenticity is the fact that they either reported on his personal field observations or derived directly from them. And back in, so Ladojinsky, he goes down to Washington, he said, look, what you've got to do is you've got to change, if anything's got to happen in Japan successfully, it's got to happen to the, at, from the bottom up. The foundation of the social structure must stand or fall in the countryside. And so the peasant and his aspirations must be at the centre of the peace. And basically he says you've got to give the land to those who work it and not to those who own it. The situation in Japan at that time was most of the farms were quite small, just two or three acres. Half of them were not owned by the people who worked them. Uh, there were small absentee landlords. The deal was you had to hand over about two-thirds of your product to the owner. And that meant dire poverty, but also no way out. Because if you try and improve things, all it does is means more for the, uh, for the landlord. So what Padinitsky said, look, you've got to, that's where you need to bring about the change. OK, I'm going to have to move two minutes. So to cut a long story short, um, <laughs> I'm going to very short, in two minutes. It happened. It happened so quickly and so efficiently and so peacefully as if it never happened. So if I talk to you about Japan, what's the basis of the economy? You've probably never heard about it. I, I haven't got time to go into more detail, but the, here's just to finish on a quote, which was, well, what is compelling Ladojinsky? Not only that this happened... The fact is that it happened successfully, and, and so successfully that it was almost seamless. Um, and th this is a description of what his motivation was. Um, firstly, as I've said, the way that he connected with what was actually going on to the, the ground. His face-to-face -face communications with hundreds of Japanese peasants resulted in another kind of shaping, an inner shaping. The peasants, their wives and children whom he encountered in the countryside, he did not see primarily as Japanese. He saw them as human beings in desperate need of help to achieve a bit of security and dignity and the prospect of a better life for their children, to which all human beings are entitled. His humanity, his sense of social justice were deeply ar ar aroused. And I'm saying so deeply aroused that he was successful. 
And we're talking here about a third of the land in Japan changing hands, about four million families benefiting, about a rapid move to prosperity, so that agricultural yields increase rapidly by 50%. So now instead of having impoverished peasants, you've got quite uh, people with surpluses. And as soon as you've got a surplus, you can move up. You can trade in your bike for a motorbike. So you now have generated a market for people to, to produce motorbikes. Onto the scene comes Honda, and things get even better. So you need a, a, a four-wheel drive truck. So on the scene comes Toyota, and then the rest is, is history. So we think of Japan as this technical innovation, but the key to the un underneath it was a change in the relationship with the land. And that happened in Taiwan and Korea as well. Uh, so there's a, a story that, but behind that, I'd say is this, this is the exact opposite of conventional wisdom. And I would say is another example of this, um, the real wisdom of facing up to the situation, having a vision of humanity, and acting in responding to what is actually there in front of you. That's probably my 20 minutes, isn't it? Thank you very much.